Thank you, Brother Tom, and for the privilege of sharing. And um, I want to say it again. It really is a privilege to come and to be with you and to worship with you. I'm waiting for someone to say, could you be a little quieter, Superintendent, because I sing kind of loud. And I was really enjoying it. By the way, I really appreciate this praise team and the spirit about them and the work that they do. I uh, just praise the Lord for the good things happening here at uh, Journey by Grace. You know, for us pastors, when we go to speak somewhere, our own church or wherever, honestly, I think almost all of us pray and say, now, Lord, what message would you have me bring uh, to the people today? What should I say? What do I need to do? How do I need to minister in a way that pleases the Lord and meets the needs of the people? And I'm not exactly sure why, but I'll trust I've found the will of the Holy Spirit. And I'd ask my... Um, secretary to develop a PowerPoint for me because I'm not able to do that. And I have a different title to the message, but I see she put in the opening here uh, the Holy Spirit. And that really is what this is about, is listening as the Holy Spirit uh, speaks to his people. Now, the, uh, the title of the message is Speaking in the Spirit. And in a moment, I, I want to share some um, a scripture with you from Acts chapter 16. You can be getting ready for that. But, but first of all, I just want to say, I want to speak to you about speaking. And I just want to ask this morning, are you good at speaking? Are you good at talking? <laughs> And some of you are like, I'm fine in private, but don't put me in front of people. That's more difficult to do. Well, I want to talk about speaking this morning. And by the way, there is an insert in your bulletin if you care to follow along for uh, the sermon notes this morning. And I'll read the introduction from that. <clears throat> and I simply ask the question then, do you like to talk? I think most of us do like to talk. And I think some of us would probably admit we may like to talk just a little bit too much. <laughs> I'm reading your faces and listening to your chuckles. Now, while there are certainly times the Lord wants us to speak up, there are also many times when he wants us to keep silent. The challenge is to submit regularly to the supervision of the Holy Spirit. And in today's message, we will discover some biblical guidelines concerning our speech. So let me try to help us with this. Again, I'm not sure why the Lord has laid this on my heart, but I'm trusting that I found his will in this. So here's the scripture, Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 10. This is the uh, story about the apostle Paul. He was a minister and a missionary. You heard me share earlier about the work of the free Methodist church around the world and some other time you can invite me to come back and <clears throat> maybe I can explain a little more about what that means. But this I have discovered that when I was growing up at our Cove Run Free Methodist Church as a teenager, I do recall back then we had 70 some thousand members in the U.S. and we still do today. And overseas we had 70 some thousand members back then and today around the million mark. It's so exciting to be a part of what God is doing around the world. In fact, we're in about uh, 80 countries around the world. And when I read a scripture like this about the Apostle Paul and his companions who were intentionally going to other places in that known world to spread the gospel, it excites me to see what God was doing for them and through them and how God was guiding them. What's interesting in this scripture is how the Holy Spirit changes the plans of the missionaries and guides them in the direction that he wants them to go. Now, your Bible probably says the same as mine, that it's Paul's vision of a man from Macedonia. Now, when I read some of these things in the Bible, I don't know about the rest of you, but I don't always understand everything it says. Would you agree? And some of these names and titles don't mean a lot. Can, can I, would I do injustice to the Scripture if I change a few of these cities and give them names you recognize? Can I call this Paul's vision of a man from the Pittsburgh area? <laughs> and I'm going to suggest that God is reaching out to us and sending us to reach those who need to hear the gospel. Let me read it to you. Acts chapter 16, beginning at verse 6. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. 
When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas during the night. Paul had a vision of a man from Pittsburgh, Macedonia, standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, he got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Let's pray over the word. Heavenly Father, thank you for your holy and inspired word. Help us, Lord, we pray today to understand what you said back then and what you are saying to your people today. Father, grant us wisdom and insight and focus and understanding and the courage we need to take what we learn and to apply this to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This again to me is a um, fascinating scripture on how God works in guiding his people. So I want to ask the question this morning, how do we know when, where, and how to speak up? And let me try to look at your faces for a moment. And ask, Is there anyone else in this sanctuary today besides me who sometimes struggles knowing when to speak and when to keep quiet? <laughs> or am I in good company this morning? <laughs> How do we know? How do you figure out what God wants you to say and when he wants you to say it? Uh, let me go on here. There is a time to speak. There is a time to speak up. I believe we must proclaim the truth of the word of God. But we must do so in love. We have to speak up on the issues of our times. We must share our faith. We have to let people know the changes God has made in our lives. We want to inspire them to know what it's like to serve Jesus Christ. There is a time that we must speak. But let me share this verse from Ephesians chapter 4 verse 15 says, speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. And let me ask again as I watch your faces, is this a challenge for anyone out there besides me? <laughs> Have you ever had somebody come to you and just rake you over the coals and go up and down about all you've done wrong and you might protest and they say, well, it's the truth. Huh? Might be. But did they speak the truth in love? And I have concerns this morning, frankly, <clears throat> for all of God's people, that particularly here in the evangelical church in the U.S., sometimes we have not communicated well. I do believe we do a great job in accurately uh, just explaining and communicating the truth of the Word of God. But I pray that God will help us when we do so to just have those words covered by the love of Jesus Christ. Speaking the truth in love. Now this I've discovered. There are some people out there, they are just naturally um, kind, pleasant, positive, easygoing. They are careful not to say anything negative about another person. Do you know anybody like that? I know a few people. I, I thought just a couple of weeks ago I was privileged to uh, participate in a funeral of a dear old saint. We all called her Aunt Dee. She was 88 years old, had been serving the Lord for a number of years. And uh, we talked about her life and uh, how um, she was such an encouragement to others. In fact, I got to see her just two or three days before she passed away. And I went into the hospital and, and I'm going to go there as pastor and I'm going to encourage Aunt Dee, right? And I talked to her and I prayed with her. But when I left, guess who was encouraged? <laughs> It just lifted my spirit. She was just praising the Lord. Now, she knew she was probably a couple of days away from eternity, but she couldn't say enough about who Christ was and how he had blessed her life and all that he had done for her and how she appreciated the Lord. When we had her funeral, some of us talked about Aunt Dee, and one thing we remembered, if you would visit her and you'd be talking and sharing, sometimes, you know, the conversation could slide into so-and-so and what they had done that they shouldn't have done. And, uh, you know, once you'd start down that road to say something, Aunt Dee would speak up and say, now, <laughs> let's not go there. 
Do you ever have anybody do that to you? Thank God for them. Amen? <laughs> Let's not go there. Let's not talk that way about someone. There are some out there it comes natural for. And their motto is, if you can't say something good about a person, don't say anything at all, right? You've heard that one before. And there's a lot of truth to that. Now, there is a time to speak up, but we must do so in love. There are some other folks out there, however, they probably say just a little more than they should. And we need to be careful in that regard. So let me help you here about what happens. There is a time to speak, but we don't do this on our own. The Holy Spirit guides. He really will guide us as to what we should do, what we should say, and where we should go. Let me ask you this question, however. Can we trust the Holy Spirit to guide our speaking? Can we trust Him to guide our lips, what we say and what we don't say? Can we trust Him to nudge us? D let me ask you this. Does it ever happen to you, it has to me, that I'm getting ready to say what I think and what I feel, and there's a little um, warning light that goes off inside my head. Does that happen to anybody else? <laughs> Do you listen to it? Now, I'm not going to tell you who, don't ask me for a name, <clears throat> but somebody I know well once put a message on Facebook. You know that thing between your head and your mouth that tells you not to speak up? She said, I don't have one. <laughs> okay, and I thought, well, you're not the only one. But uh, for most of us, there's that little warning bell that goes off inside before we say something and we shouldn't say it. The Holy Spirit will help us to guard our lips if we want Him to do so. Let me ask you this. Did you ever say something and the second it left your mouth, you said, oh, yeah, uh-oh, I wish I hadn't done that, right? The moment you did it, but it's too late to take it back, isn't it? Folks, I want us to understand our words are powerful. They can uplift and encourage and bring healing in people's lives, or they can tear down. And I can tell you as a pastor counseling with many folks that word wounds run deeper than physical ones, and we need to be careful what we say. The Holy Spirit guides us. Now, you can see here the Holy Spirit guided the Apostle Paul to the area of Pittsburgh, Macedonia, and led him and his companions to go to the place they needed to go. Let me give you a little bit of a, um, a, a map here. I don't know about the rest of you, but I enjoy maps, and hopefully you can see this. Here's the Asia Minor area. Down here in the Judea area is where the Apostle Paul and his companions began in this journey and what often was done either by land or sometimes by sea he had come up in here to what we uh, what was called then Asia Minor uh, modern-day Turkey and he's working his way up from the south to the north and as he goes northward here in the Galatia area he kept trying to go east kept trying to go inward the further north he went he tried to go east and the Holy Spirit said, no, go this way. He went further, couldn't go inland. In fact, he made himself to several areas up here. This is Galatia. You see what they called Asia then. There's another area here called Mysia, right here. The town, the area of Bithynia is up here on the coast of the Black Sea in that area. And the Apostle Paul was trying hard to get into that area. When it says the Spirit of Jesus wouldn't let them, they moved westward here to a town on the coast, and I don't have it there, called Troas. When they reached Troas, this is when Paul had the vision, and there was a man from here, the area of Macedonia, saying, come, and, come over here and help us. They ended up in here, the chief city called Philippi. So Paul and his companions made their way to this main city. Why? All the time he's trying to go eastward into other areas to share the gospel message with people who surely needed it. But the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Jesus would not allow him to do it. Finally, when they made their way to Philippi, I want to say this. His obedience brought about, in my opinion, the birth of perhaps the most faithful church of his entire ministry, and that is the Philippian church. Now, I'll change it and call it Pittsburgh instead. Again, they're trying to go to eastward to Baltimore and uh, Philadelphia and uh, New York City, and instead God leads them here. And in so doing, a faithful church is planted. Now, let me ask this question after sharing that. Does God know 
what he's doing. Would you agree he does? Well, what percentage of the time? <laughs> yeah. Really? Can you trust God to do the right thing in your life 100% of the time? I suspect if I passed out a written test this morning, you would all make 100%. But I think we all know it's more difficult sometimes, isn't it? Can you trust God even when things don't go like we think they should? Do you ever wonder what God is up to? Anybody other than me? Do you ever wonder what the Lord is up to? I, I want to confess to you this morning. I was preaching uh, probably a couple of months ago, and, and the folks were amening, and they seemed to be listening, and I thought it went well. And after service was over, you know, I'm shaking the hands. And, and one uh, a gentleman came up to me, and he was kind about it. He said, you know, Pastor Jim, can I, can I make a suggestion? I said, go right ahead. He said, you know, when you're preaching to us and saying, now you need to do this and you need to do that, he said, could you include yourself once in a while? <laughs> I thanked him. I said, you know what, brother? You are absolutely right. <clears throat> when I say, do you ever struggle wondering what God is up to? Let me change that. Do we ever struggle wondering what God is up to in our lives? And I have to confess to you, even as I was speaking just a moment ago, the Holy Spirit reminded me of an incredibly difficult time in our lives, a terrible time of tragedy. A family member was murdered. Some other things happened. It was horrible. This was over 20 years ago. But I, I want to confess to you this morning, I too struggled with, what is God doing? What is He up to? I wonder, now I know I can trust God. I know that's what the Bible teaches. I understand that's how it works. But aren't there times in our lives, humanly, we wonder what God's up to, don't you? And I think we struggle, but if we listen, the Holy Spirit will guide our every step. He'll show us this is the direction to go. Not only does the Holy Spirit guide, the Holy Spirit also helps us decide what to do. For instance, He will help us to decide when it is time to speak up. And when I say speak up, for instance, there is a time when you need to witness to someone and tell them what Christ has done in your life. And the Holy Spirit will help you to decide what to say and how to say it and where to say it and what manner to use while you're involved in that. Now, I don't know about the rest of you, but I've observed a time or two or three when someone was trying to witness... <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think they were doing it in a very effective way. Sometimes they're being too harsh and overbearing and kind of in your face. But the Holy Spirit helps us to figure out when and how to do it. Also, the Holy Spirit will help you to know when to give comfort. The Spirit gives special insights into people's lives. Now... Some of you are really good at this. Some of you have the gift of compassion and the ability to understand. Some of you also have really good radar that works exceptionally well. And you can read people. And you go up to someone and say, hello, how are you today? And they say, fine. And you read their faces and their body language and the tone of their voice. And you're able to say, you know, brother or sister, I can tell things aren't quite fine with you today. I sense there's a need in your life, and God just helps you to help them open up and share what is in their hearts and minds. The Holy Spirit gives insights, and maybe sometime you need to call or send a text message or a card or a letter of encouragement. Maybe He'll lead you to give someone a gift or just go up to them and give a warm embrace. The point of this is we need to learn to speak and to respond as the Holy Spirit leads. There is a time to speak. With the help and the grace of God, we do need to speak up. Now let me move on, and you can probably figure out this next one without my help. There's also a time to keep, say it again, silent. Huh? There's a time to keep silent. <laughs> and um, I have a note here to say, this is the hard part. No amens on that one? <laughs> 
This is the hard part, isn't it? Don't you feel passionate sometimes and really strong about what's happening in someone else's life and you just really want to give it to them and say, you know what, you need to straighten up. You need to stop this right now. You have a problem here and I can tell you what it is and this is how it needs to be fixed. Do you ever feel that way? <laughs> Now as I look across the congregation, this is where the halos pop up above your heads. And everyone smiles and said, no, superintendent, not me. <laughs> I wasn't born yesterday. Isn't it hard sometimes not just to talk to them, not be honest with me. Don't you want to grab hold of some people and shake them and say, you know, is there a brain in your head? Don't you realize what you're doing? Do you think this stuff too? Then don't look at me like that. I'm feeling bad here for a moment. Like, I'm, no, really. You just want to take hold of some of these people and say, well, you wake up and realize what's happening in your life. Is that a good time to speak to them? Yeah, probably not. <laughs> it might be wise to slow down, pray a little bit, and just see what the Lord would have you to do. Let me explain from the scripture here. The apostle Paul was forbidden to preach. Forbidden to preach the gospel in Asia. Now why? Isn't it a good thing to preach the gospel? But he was forbidden by the Holy Spirit, none, no less, to preach the gospel in, in Asia. Why would the Holy Spirit do that? Well, he didn't like the people in Asia, right? <laughs> he didn't care if they got saved, right? You know that's not true. Uh, why was he doing this? Well, I don't know. Would they not listen to the Apostle Paul? Is there a chance that harm would come to the missionaries if they had gone that direction instead of the direction God was telling them to go? I think that's quite possible. Why did the Holy Spirit do it? Actually, bottom line, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not exactly... Well, you didn't want to hear that from the pastor, did you? I don't know why he does this. You know what, today, if I can be honest with you, you know, this much I've learned about the up-and-coming generations. I understand I'm old. I accept that. I'm fighting it. <laughs> I still carry on. But I, I know what I'm learning from younger folks. They want us to be real and genuine and honest and upfront honest with you this morning, I don't have all this stuff figured out. And I don't know why God does what he does. And he doesn't consult with me, you know? I mean, this is so strange. This I know. God knows what he is doing. And he has a purpose for all of it. What is interesting here, the Apostle Paul himself did not immediately know why he and his companions were blocked from entering into Asia. What was God up to? You sometimes, I, you know what, here's what I'm going to do, okay? When we get to heaven and we sang about and what it's going to be like and it'll be wonderful, I want to be in that great big Bible study in the sky when I'm sitting at the feet of Jesus and say, I got a question. No. <laughs> Why did you do that? <clears throat> also, I, here's what I'm going to say, Jesus, could you please show me the video of Paul and his other companions? Because I want to see him sitting there with the others when he's praying and they're trying to go into Bithynia and other places and the Spirit of Jesus won't let them. I want to hear some of them saying, hey Paul, what, how's come? <laughs> What's going on here? Why won't God let us do that? And I want to see Paul's response. Now I believe he was smart enough, wise enough, educated enough, experienced enough to know God knows what he's doing and makes no mistakes and God's going to take care of them. But I want to see what the Lord was up to. God didn't do it. Let me answer it this way. The Holy Spirit knows best. No amens on that one. The Holy Spirit knows best. Even when it doesn't make sense to us. Have you ever faced some... This is a dumb question. Have you ever faced some disappointments in your life? Have some things happened that you're like, I do not know why that has happened. Why must I be disappointed? Now here comes a saying, and you're, you're going to know this one. Our disappointments are often God's appointments. Have you experienced that? Do you understand that in your life? As I was saying that earlier today, the thought occurred to me again. Somebody out there, you're being nice, but you're probably thinking to yourself, <laughs> get real. I mean, so that's the excuse when things go wrong in my life and don't work out the way I think they should. That sounds pretty trite. Our disappointments are often God's appointments. But they really are, aren't they? 
This is often the way God works to mold and shape our lives the direction He wants us to go. Here's the problem I have. I, I often feel the pressure to speak up and try to fix the situation myself. I'm the only one that does that. <laughs> The nature of my personality, when something goes wrong instantly, my default response is, well, I'm going to fix that by doing. And so I try. And guess what happens to the situation? <laughs> you know what? It's worse. I mess it up more than ever before. And then I think to pray and say, well, Lord, now that I've made a mess of it even worse, can you help me to fix what I've done? And thank God he's understanding and will do it. We often feel the pressure to speak up and try to fix the situation. Frankly, as much as I respect the Apostle Paul, I really believe that's what he was doing. Each time it says he tried to go here and the Holy Spirit wouldn't let him. And he tried to go there and the Spirit of Jesus wouldn't let them. The further north he went and tried to go east, the more that God pushed him westward in the direction that God wanted him to go. It's human nature to want to fix things ourselves. One way we try to do it is by what we say. But sometimes it's best to... Do I need to fill this one in? <laughs> Bite your tongue. Do we need to practice? Go ahead. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> there are times I wish I had bitten my tongue before I spoke up. How about you? You can't take it back. So there are times when the Holy Spirit does not want us to speak. Why? Why would he do that? You know what? There's a possibility you may do more harm than good. <laughs> I wrote myself a note. Been there, done that. Can anybody identify with me? <laughs> you people are being angels this morning. You know, you could do more harm than good. Also, you may be misunderstood. Do you understand that? The way you come across, I love you, <laughs> But the way you come across, you could be misunderstood. See, because your personality might be close to mine, and you're a bit of a bulldozer sometimes, and you're a little bit too strong, and you don't really know what the person's going through, and you want to give them a piece of your mind, and they're not really in a place that they want to listen to it. And, or to me. <laughs> You could be misunderstood. I've discovered this since I became superintendent. Boy, have I been misunderstood so many, many times. I can't believe some of the things that I have supposedly said to other people. <laughs> some, I won't tell you that uh, in a public worship service. Ask me privately. But there are some interesting things that, that it's said has come for me. I was misunderstood. Here's another thing. You may not be the person to do the talking in that particular situation. God may have someone else he has prepared to assist that person. And if you don't listen, you may actually hinder the work of the Lord. And so there are times when the Holy Spirit does not want us to speak. What's that little phrase? Silence is golden, right? We had a different phrase in my house where I was growing up. By the way, I am the second oldest of seven children. There were nine of us growing up in this house. And my dad changed that to say, silence is golden. That's why we're so poor. <laughs> there was precious little silence <laughs> in the home in which I grew up in. But I've come to appreciate what that means is, you know what, sometimes it's better to be silent, isn't it? Let me say this also. <clears throat> there is a ministry of listening. There is a ministry of, of listening. I, I've had it happen to me a, a number of times. I've had folks come and say, Pastor, I'm just so burdened. I, I need to talk to you. I need to sit down. And, and can, can you give me some counseling? Sure. And I set up a time. And we sit down and they come into my office. And they just explode. And they talk. And they talk. And they talk. And they unload. And they vent. And they share. And they get up an hour and a half later and go out the door and say, Oh, Pastor, you've helped me so much. Thank you. I couldn't squeeze a word in edgewise if I wanted to. But what did they need? Did they need me to talk? Did they need me to give them advice? Did they need me to scold them for what they were doing wrong? Did they need me to say anything? There is a ministry of listening. Often, we can do more good by keeping completely silent. <laughs> Amen. Preach it, superintendent. Uh, 
I love you too, sorry. <laughs> and I promised I was going to behave, but I lied. Okay. All right. Oh, you're going to love this next verse. Let's see. Um, my buddy, James, there is a ministry of listening. Okay, James 1.26. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. And I wrote on my notes here, ouch. Huh? Right? But is this not true? That if we're claiming to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and we don't work by the grace of God to keep a tight rein on the tongue, <laughs> that religion isn't worth a whole lot. I'm not sure if I should share this or not, but maybe I will anyhow. One of these illustrations came to mind. I remember I mentioned to you about the household in which I grew up in, and there were seven of us children, and I was the second oldest, and we did have a pretty big house, and my dear mother would be cleaning up one room, and we kids would be ripping up three other ones, you know. And it was just chaos much as it seemed perfectly normal to me. And on and on this would go, and I do remember my dear mother getting frustrated, and she would say, oh, you kids are enough to make a preacher swear. <laughs> I didn't know what she meant by that. I thought, the preachers don't do that. And I, I, but I looked at this and said, if you don't keep a tight rein on your tongue. And then I've heard people say, man, today I almost lost my religion. Well, let me encourage us not to lose what God has given us. But instead, may I suggest that we just surrender and let the Holy Spirit be the one in control, okay? All right. I was not born yesterday. I'm getting too close. Let's move on. Next Sunday. There's time to speak. There's a time to keep silent. You know what? There's a time to just trust. How about that? There's a time to trust in the Holy Spirit. Now let me ask a dumb question. Can we trust God? You think so? <laughs> when? Oh yeah, all the time. I do remember when my <clears throat> little boys were little boys. I remember, <laughs> I'll tell on myself, my wife would say, don't do that. I said, oh, don't worry about it, dear. After church was over, I was in one church when they were three, four years old and had a big high ceiling. Remember one of those old fashioned ones? And when everyone would leave, I'd say, come here, boys. Guess what I would do? <laughs> you know what I did, don't you? I said, come here. And I would grab them one at a time and throw them as high in the air as I possibly could. I didn't drop them. Despite convincing evidence to the contrary, I never dropped them on their head. No, 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 no. We had a good old time. I could stand them up on the wall and step back three feet and say, jump to daddy. The thought never occurred to them that I wouldn't catch him, right? And I always did, honest. Now I do it with the grandbabies, by the way. And they're just as crazy as when my kids were little. And I'm loving it. They absolutely, totally trust me, right? Do you understand I love my kids? If you're a parent or a grandparent, you understand I just love my grandbabies. Man, do I have a blast. I wouldn't think for a moment of not doing the right thing for them. And I'm human and fallible, have all kinds of issues. We can trust God 100% of the time. Let me show you what happened to the missionaries here. Paul and his companions, they were blocked. They were blocked from moving ahead the direction they wanted to go. They wanted to go to several other places and preach the gospel message. Now, isn't that a great idea? I mean, I thought they had wonderful plans that they had laid out. I'll bet you they had a map. We'll go here, we'll go here, we'll go there. We're going to preach the gospel. Thousands will come to faith in Christ. This is going to be wonderful. We'll plant churches every step of the way. They prayed over it. They wanted to evangelize all over Asia Minor. And every single time they tried to, the Holy Spirit said, No. You're not going. It doesn't make sense. Let me, let me go back to uh, verse 7 here. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried. They tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Does that make any sense at all? Now, how can they trust God? They've prayed. They've planned. They've put their resources into it. They're out here on a missions trip. And every single time they try, God says, no, not there. No, you're not going there. No, not to that area. No, no, no. Until he pushes them the direction he wants them to go. By the way, this town, Bithynia, 
is mentioned only twice in the entire Bible. Once here that I just read to you. And one more time later in the New Testament in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2, his first pastoral letter to all of the churches out there. And guess where one of them was? <laughs> Bithynia. He writes to the church in Bithynia. Now here's what happened. The Holy Spirit obviously later on led somebody else to plant a church in that area. Why? Why couldn't it be the Apostle Paul? Was he not good enough? Did he not know the Bible? <laughs> Inside and out. Wasn't he holy enough? Didn't he follow God? Didn't he obey the Lord? Of course he did. So why did the Holy Spirit choose someone other than Paul to plant that church? You want the nice answer or the plain one? <laughs> Let me give you the plain one. <laughs> it's none of my business. Huh? Is it any of my business what God wants to do with you or with me or with anything else in the world? Does he answer to us? Must he explain to us what he's doing in your life right now and the stuff that you're going through? That sounded strong, forgive me. Here's the point. The Holy Spirit knows exactly what he is doing. And Paul was not the one to do it. Let me say it this way. God's timing is always best. I have prayed to the Lord a number of times and said, Oh Lord, I can't fix this. I don't know what to do about it, but it would sure be great if you would fix it this way. Have you ever done that? <laughs> Some of you say no, but your faces give you away. Isn't it easy to advise the Lord as to what to do? In this case, God's timing is always best. The Apostle Paul was not the one then, a wonderful man of God. He was not the one to do it at this time. God had somebody else in mind to plant that church, to win people to Christ, to mature them and make disciples of them, and God used them in a great way. So learn to, did you figure that one out? Thank you. Learn to listen to the Holy Spirit. Do you listen well? Can I make a confession? I don't. It's a problem. And my wife says, my hearing's getting bad because of age. And I say, huh? <laughs> we were with a group of people once, my wife and I and some others, and they're speaking Spanish. And some of you know, I'm really trying hard to learn Spanish. And I, and I try to do it. I can speak it a little bit. But they were talking to me, and I finally said, you know, I don't listen well enough in Spanish. You want to guess what my wife said? <laughs> he doesn't listen good in English either. <laughs> and I hate to admit it, but she's right. I mean, it is true that often I struggle listening and I have to train myself to do it. So I'm saying listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. No matter how strong your own inclination, no matter how right it may seem to you, God knows what he is doing. Do you agree? What percentage of the time? I, I understand that 100% all of the time, but let's be human once more. Is it always easy to trust that God's working things out for my good? I want to be honest with you and real and genuine this morning. I, it doesn't make sense to me sometimes. I don't pretend to have it all figured out. But I will say this. I can look back at all these years of serving the Lord, and I can tell you without hesitation, God has always known what he was doing in my life. And I've learned that I can trust the Lord. Let me give you another verse here. Back to verse 10. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Pittsburgh, Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Do you notice that word, concluding? <laughs> There's an ornery side in me that wants to say, well, duh. You know, you tried to go this way and God said no. Then you tried again to go this way and God said no. And you, you tried again to go this way and God said no. So finally, he hits you in the head with the two before and gives you a vision and said, here's where you go. So they concluded this is the direction that God wants us to go. Let me say this, folks, to us this morning. When we're trying to figure out what God wants us to do, may I suggest that we use this and this in making those decisions, right? 
Can we use both our heart and our head in determining what the Lord wants us to say and when and how to do it? We've got to listen closely. God has blessed us with intelligence and experiences in life that help to prepare us for what we are to do. Use that and use your heart to follow the Lord. You ever have somebody come up to you and say, the Lord told me to tell you, <laughs> and the moment they do that, <clears throat> there is a caution flag that goes up in front of me. Now listen, depends on who it is. There are people out there whose walk with God is so close, whom I so respect and admire, I listen with both ears intently to whatever they have to say. But frankly, sometimes I remind folks that I am on speaking terms with the Holy Spirit. And I am confident that when he wants to speak to me, he will do so notwithstanding my problem of not listening as closely as I should. So let's use every available resource to determine where, when, and how, or if God wants you to speak. <clears throat> Always let the Holy Spirit lead. Always let the Holy Spirit lead, and you cannot go wrong. It is when self gets in the way that we get into trouble. Would you agree? I've entitled this Speaking in the Spirit. And, and I will tell you, I try so hard, honestly, I do, on a daily basis and throughout the day, asking the Holy Spirit to help me to say what I should and to keep silent when I should. And I'll confess in front of this church, I don't succeed 100% of the time. But I have found... When I listen and when I obey, God blesses my life and my ministry and uses me to bless other people as well. Would you like for the Holy Spirit to use you? Let's always let the Holy Spirit then lead our lives. Amen? Can I pray for us? Let's pray.